Amen. Amen. All right. I'm sure tonight's uh, uh, text was maybe a hint of what I'm going to be preaching on. And by the time I get into the subject, uh, you are not going to be surprised why I'm preaching on this tonight. And I'm going to go ahead and address this issue from the very beginning. And I'm not going to mince words even slightly. So there are some people that are, you know, I, and they're not associated with us. They're not related to us. I would call them brethren. Uh, you know, I would say from what I know from these people, I love them. But I am going to be exposing a major false teaching that they're getting into. And this, and this is, I've, I've meditated on this. I've looked more and more into it. And it is, it is sincerely a major false teaching. And I'm going to be touching on here in a little bit later, more towards the conclusion of the sermon, why it is so dangerous. And it ties in with last week's subject. Now, these people, let me explain very clearly, uh, you know, my perception of this particular subject. Now, I don't hate these people. I love these people. Like I said, I believe that they are brethren. I believe that, uh, I'm sure that there is a sincerity behind this and there may even be, you know, an inkling of humility and there may even be, uh, you know, you know, they themselves may have been deceived by someone else. Maybe they saw someone else teaching something along these lines and and, and, I, and I know that to be true to a degree uh, but this is this I want everyone to understand before I get into this subject it's not something small it's something major someone started a church over this you know basically over this exact issue people have changed their doctrine and the whole structure of the church basically of how the church is supposed to run in their mind is based upon this now does that sound like something small or big that's major that is major. They are changing the course of how God ordained the church to run. Now, I am going to go ahead and say this as well. There are people that are teaching this. There are, and I don't care whose feelings this hurt, who gets angry at me. I don't care. There are people that are teaching this right now. And the reason why is because they have a major problem with authority. Do you hear what I said? They have a major problem with authority. I've held back from touching on this exact subject, but that's what it comes down to. These same people, and last week's sermon was related to this, these same people are the same people that have a problem with setting a man over the congregation, which is what God ordains in every time when he says, hey, this is the type of system I want in the church. It's always set a man over the congregation every single time. And they look at the, you know, uh, when there's a man ruling over the congregation and they say, oh, it's like he's lording over the, you know, God's heritage or you know, he's like, he's like uh, Diotrephes and all of these types of things. The reason why they act that way is because they have a problem with the authority that God gave to that man that's set over the congregation. The whole re and they try to act like, this is the problem too, they try to act like that it's the man that's set over the congregation like, it, like it's, it's his uh, uh, prideful attitude. But really it's the reverse. Right. It's their pride is what's causing them to resist the man that is set over the congregation. That's actually what's going on. And this doctrine as well is, is for the exact same reason. It's because of pride. It's because they want to be the voice that is heard. Now I'm, the title of the sermon this evening is Prophets and prophesying. Prophets and prophesying. So this is a, a uh, confusing, confusing topic for a lot of people. I, I find it very funny that it's found in um, um, you know, the, the, the chapter I'm going to be focusing on later on and the core of our issue, let me word it that way, the core of the issue for these people is actually found in a chapter where the Bible says, for God is not the author of confusion. Speaking about this exact same subject, now I'm going to show you that this is not a confusing subject at all. It, when you really study it out, I've never spent a ton of time to study this out, and I have a new uh, uh, found understanding of this issue, and really, it, really, the understanding of the Bible on this, the correct interpretation, is what the majority of the old IFB believes about this particular doctrine. It really is. The, what they believe prophets and prophesying to be, the old IFB happens to be right. And guess what? Stephen Anderson and the new IFB happen to be wrong about this understanding. I'm going to explain very clearly from the Bible. And let me say this, because the other side, I've heard them say that it's so clear. There's no misunderstanding it. It's so clear. I'm going to take you through. No stone unturned. I have 10 pages of notes, so if you're you know, tired, go get coffee. This is super, super important. I have 10 pages of notes right now, and I'm going to take you through, I mean, numerous times of when the word prophet, numerous times of when the word prophesy is used in the Old Testament, the New Testament, and let me tell you, 
I agree it is as clear as can possibly be it is super clear extremely clear but it's the exact opposite it's very different than what these people say that it means it is extremely clear and listen to this it is extremely consistent from beginning to end almost every single time that it comes up I want you to turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter number 9 we're gonna start off very basic and very simple this morning we're gonna, we're gonna start off by defining terms because the issue with the understanding on uh, these people's part is not that they just simply misunderstand the text of 1 Corinthians 14. It's that they have more of a, a basic misunderstanding and it's they misunderstand the very definition of a word that is used there. Now, if you misunderstand the definition of a word, it doesn't matter what text you're reading. It doesn't matter what chapter it is. If you have the wrong a uh, uh, concept of what a word means, the wrong understanding of what a word means, every time you see that word, you're going you're to misinterpret that passage. Every single time you see that word, you're not going to be able to understand that passage. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off very simple, and we're going to start off very basic, and we're going to get the definition of what a prophet is. Then we're going to see exactly how God uses a prophet and what a prophet actually does. Of course, prophesy is what a, what a prophet does. We're going to see what happens when someone prophesies and how this actually works and what it means. So here in 1 Samuel chapter number 9, I want you to look with me at verse number 7. It says this, Then said Saul to his servant, But behold, if we go, what shall we bring the man? For the bread is spent in our vessels, and there is not a present to bring to the man of God. What have we? So looking for the man of God, this is of course Samuel, it says in verse 8, And the servant answered Saul again and said, Behold, I have here at hand the fourth part of a shekel of silver, that will I give to the man of God to tell us our way. So notice it's talking about the man of God. Now I want you to look at verse number 9. It says, Before time in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, thus he spake, Come and let us go to the seer. Then it says this, For he that is now called a prophet was before time called a seer. Now this verse right here is packed filled with a bunch of information for us. Number one, we can see that a prophet is also referred to as a what? A man of God. What else is he referred to as in verse number nine? A seer, right? He is referred to as a seer. Now many people misunderstand the word prophet and think that it just means preacher, right? Let me give you the Bible's definition of prophet, seer. That is the Bible's definition of prophet. It is a seer. Now, why are they called prophets? Why are they called seers? Because I preached a full sermon about this. Every time the Word of God comes to a prophet, I'm talking about a revelation from the Word of God. Do you know how it comes almost every time? In a vision or in a dream. Almost every single time. There may be no exceptions to this. I'm just being trying to be careful with words. Almost every single time the Word of God comes, it comes in a vision or it comes in a dream. That's why he's called a seer because he sees these things. He's called a seer. So notice what a prophet is. It's a what? It's a seer. He's actually receiving a vision or he's actually receiving a dream from the Lord. And you know what he does? Then he prophesies, right? Then he will preach. Now, here, let me say this. I do want to say this from the beginning. I, I meant to say this already. Now, what the word preach means the word preach is, a, meth, is a, a style of delivery, right? Now, what the word preach means is I can stand up here and I can teach to you. I can teach the Word of God. And what am I doing when I teach the Word of God? You know, I'm, I'm actually showing you something new. But does that necessarily mean that I'm preaching? No, it doesn't, does it? Because preaching is what? It's a style that's more in your face, right? Quit preaching at me, right? You can preach a false message. Now, when prophets prophesy... The way that they can deliver that message is by preaching, okay? So don't think that just preaching and prophesying are interchangeable. What they're doing while they're prophesying is they're preaching because they're yelling. That's basically what preaching is, right? So they can prophesy and they can do it by the method of preaching. Just like you can teach and you can do it by the method of preaching. Does everyone understand what I'm saying? So those two things are not perfectly synonymous. It's the method of delivery. It's the way in which you deliver that. So a lot of people try to say, well, preaching and prophesying are exactly the same. Wrong. Totally false. Not true. The perfect definition of a prophet is a seer. That is the Bible's definition of a prophet. Do you know why? 
I'm going to go ahead and tell you the definition of, from the Bible, uh, in my own words, and you're going to see this happen over and over and over again. A prophet is not a normal preacher. A prophet is not a man that just stands up and takes scripture that's written down and just uses his own understanding and preaches from the word of God, what is written in scripture. A prophet is a seer, just as we saw, which receives a vision or a dream, and through the spirit of the Lord, he gives you a new revelation. Through the spirit of the Lord, he gives you a new understanding or a new message that comes directly from God. That is the Bible's definition of a prophet. And every single time someone prophesies, the Spirit of the Lord comes upon them. It's not like me just standing up here and preaching to you. That is not, I'm not prophesying to you, right? We're going to see this very, very clearly. So we see here in 1 Samuel chapter number 9, verse number 9, number one, a perfect definition of prophet is seer. That is what it is. Why? Because he is seeing a vision or he is seeing a dream. Isaiah chapter number 30 verse number 9 and 10 says this. That, is, that, this, that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord. Then verse 10, it says this. Which say to the seers, see not. So notice, they're called a seer because they see things. They literally see visions and dreams. So what does a prophet do? He sees visions and dreams. A prophet is a seer. They are one in the same. What does a prophet do? He sees visions. He sees dreams. So now we have an understanding of what a prophet is. When God comes to a man and he, he uh, gives these visions and dreams to them and he speaks the word of the Lord, what always happens? What always happens throughout the Bible? The Spirit of the Lord comes upon him and he speaks the Word of God. I want you to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 10. It works out perfect because we're right here. 1 Samuel chapter number 10, verse number 6. This actually happens to Saul, who is going to be the king, King Saul. Watch how this works. 1 Samuel chapter number 10, verse number 6. It says this. Uh, look at verse 5 first. And after that thou shalt come to the hill of God, where is the garrison of the Philistines, and it shall come to pass when thou art come thither to the city that thou shalt meet a company of prophets coming down from the high place with a psaltery and a tabard and a pipe and a harp before them, and they shall prophesy. Watch verse 6. And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee. Now watch the result of that. And thou shalt prophesy with them and shalt be turned into another man. And let it be when these signs are come unto thee that that thou do as occasion serve thee, for God is with thee. Verse 8. And thou shalt go down before me to Gilgal, and behold, I will come down unto thee to offer burnt offerings. Skip down to verse 9. And it was so that when he had turned his back to go from Saul, God gave him another heart, and all those signs came to pass that day. Verse 10. And when they came thither to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him. Watch this. And the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. Verse 11. And it came to pass when all that knew him before time saw that, behold, watch this, he prophesied among the prophets. Then the people said one to another, What is this that has come unto the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? Now, does this sound like he just all of a sudden starts preaching the word of God? Is that why people are like, What is this? No, everyone preached the word of God. Everyone taught their children the word of God, my friend. Notice it says that the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. Notice it said that it was a sign. This is something miraculous. Like when God's Spirit is sent to a man and he literally speaks the word of God through him. It is a sign. It is a wonder. It is miraculous to the point where people are like, is Saul also among the prophets? See, I'm not standing up here to you and every word that I say is not the word of the Lord. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm not just, the Spirit of the Lord is not just speaking every single word through me. That's not how preachers preach today. So what I'm doing right now is not the same as Saul. When Saul went there, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Saul. This is not just the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It came upon him and and God literally spoke words through Saul, just like he did all the prophets of the Old Testament. And then they wrote it down and they pinned it down in a book. This is what we're going to see of prophecy every time in the Bible. Go to Numbers chapter number 11. Numbers chapter number 11. <clears throat> Numbers chapter number 11. We're going to see this again. I've seen this passage actually used and misunderstood by people many times. Numbers chapter number 11, look at verse number 25. And the Lord came down in a cloud and spake unto him, watch this, and took of the spirit that was upon him and gave it unto the 70 elders. <clears throat> and it came to pass, watch this, that when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied and did not cease. Notice, the spirit of the Lord is coming upon them and they're prophesying. Verse 26, but there remained two of the men in the camp 
The name of the one was Eldad and the name of the other Medad. And the Spirit rested upon them. So these two of the 70 were actually in the camp. And the Spirit comes upon them and they're prophesying. Notice, when you're prophesying, it's when the Spirit of the Lord is coming upon you. I want you to notice that it's very important that this same thing is spoken of when the prophets write Scripture. It is the exact same thing. Look at verse number uh, 27. And there ran a young man and told Moses and said, Eldad and Medad do prophesy in the camp. And Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of Moses, one of his young men, answered and said, My Lord, Moses, forbid them. Verse 29, And Moses said unto, them, unto him, Envious thou for my sake? Would God that all the Lord's people were prophets? Now watch this. And that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. What's the definition of prophesying so far every time when we see it? The Spirit of the Lord comes upon a man and he speaks the Word of God. This is the Spirit of God speaking through man. The Spirit of the Lord is are moving these men. The Holy Ghost are moving these men and they are speaking the Word of God every single time. I want you to, uh, I'm going to read to you 1 Peter chapter number 1 verse number 20 with that in mind. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. Watch this very carefully. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So, what is prophecy that we have written in this book? It was written down by men that were moved by the Holy Ghost. So, what is prophecy? Where does it come from? It comes from men that are moved by the Holy Ghost. It's not just someone standing up and preaching the Word of God. That is not what prophecy is. It is it's more specific than that. Than that, It is a man standing up and being moved by the Holy Ghost. He is, is, is this the same as the words in the sermon that I'm preaching to you right now? Not at all. I am not preaching to you prophecy. You know, that's not what I'm doing. And it's not a new revelation that I'm being given from the Lord where the Spirit of the Lord is speaking through me. That's not what's happening right now. They're not the same thing. Not at all. The Spirit of the Lord comes upon a man and he speaks the word of the Lord through him. I want you to go now with me to... Go to Numbers chapter number 12. Numbers chapter number 12. <clears throat> So I'm not speaking the inspired, my words are not the inspired word of God up here, are they? But Eldad and Medad was. That's what they were doing, wasn't it? Saul, what was Saul doing? <clears throat> the Spirit of the Lord came upon him and Saul was among the prophets. He was prophesying. It was prophecy. You know what's in this book? Prophecy. <clears throat> are there any errors in this? <clears throat> None. You know why? Because it came from the Spirit of the Lord. It came from the prophets. That is the definition. These are, every time you see the word prophet, you know what you could use in the place of it? Seer. Seer. It's not just a preacher, it is a seer. That's the definition from the Bible. It is a seer. Look at Numbers chapter number 11, <clears throat> verse number, oh, I'm sorry, we just went there. What did I say? Numbers what? 12. Numbers 12. Look at Numbers 12. <clears throat> Numbers chapter number 12, verse number 6. This is very interesting. Watch this. Look at verse 5 first. And the Lord came down in the pillar of the cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forth. <clears throat> and he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. Verse 7. My, spirit, my servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in dark speeches. And the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Wherefore then were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Now notice there, he tells you how he deals with prophets. I want you to notice that. He says in verse number 6, how he's going to... You want to know the way in which you're going to find out whether you're a prophet? Look at verse 6. Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him. Watch this. In a vision, and will speak unto him in a dream. Do you know how you know whether you're a prophet? Is God speaking unto you in a dream? Is God speaking unto you in a vision? Do you have new words from the Lord? Then you're not a prophet. You're not a prophet then. That's it. Game over. Stop calling yourself a prophet. And let, you, people don't understand how brazen and how stubborn and how just, just heretical this is in, the, in light of Scripture when you really study it out. That's why you need to make, your 100, make sure you're 100% about things before you go out saying them and teaching them. 
A man that is a prophet, God says, here's how you're going to know I'm a prophet, that you're a prophet. I'm going to speak unto you. I'm going to make myself known unto you in a vision. I'm going to speak unto you in a dream. You know why? Because if you're a prophet, you're a seer. You know what you're saying when you say I'm a prophet? You're saying I'm a seer. You're, you're saying that you are a seer. Do you see how ridiculous this is? A prophet is a seer. How does God speak to him? And here's the thing. He's not saying that I'll just do this right now. That people misunderstand this passage. He's saying this is how you'll know whether I'm that you're a prophet. Because he says afterwards, write to Moses, my, my servant Moses is not so. Notice that. Who is faithful in all mine house. With him will I speak mouth to mouth. So he's just saying this is how you can know you're a prophet. But I don't deal with Moses that way. This is how I deal with uh, Moses in this way. Totally different. Why? His, because Moses is, is highly regarded by God. You know, he, God loves Moses very much. He speaks to him uh, face to face as he speaks unto a friend, right? So he even de dealt with Moses a little bit different than he dealt with a standard prophet. But you know what a prophet? You know how you know you're a prophet? If you're like, hey, I'm trying to figure out whether I'm a prophet of God. I think I might be a prophet. Well, have you had any visions lately from God? Have you had any dreams lately from God? Then you're not a prophet. Don't call yourself a prophet. And if you're not comfortable calling yourself a seer, don't call yourself a prophet because a seer is a prophet. They are one in the same according to the, to the Bible. You are saying that you think that you are speaking inspired, the inspired word of God. You're saying you think that the, the spirit of the Lord is coming upon you and moving you and you are speaking the word of the Lord. That's what you're saying. I want you to turn with me now to Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 3. It is the inspired word of the Lord. It is a new revelation. That is what is going on. It is God speaking through you and it is a new revelation or it is a mystery that is being revealed. Most of the time, it, prophecy is speaking about future events. That's why you hear it that way. Uh, 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 truthfully, when you look at it, that's normally what it is. It really is. Study it out. Most of the time, because it is a new revelation, oftentimes these prophecies aren't just, just random truths. They are future events. I want you to look here in Deuteronomy 13. We get another definition of what a prophet is. Notice, we're going to find definitions over and over and over again. They're all going to be the same. They're all consistent over and over and over again. Look at Deuteronomy 13. Chapter 13, verse 1. It says this, If there rise among you a what? A prophet. Now watch this. Or a dreamer of dreams. Why does it say that? Because a prophet is someone that is a seer and they are a dreamer of dreams or they see visions. Look at what it says next. And give it thee a sign or a wonder. Does this sound like just a normal preacher? No, it's ridiculous. Look at the next verse, verse 2. And the sign or the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Now notice he gave a sign or a wonder, and then what does it say? And the sign or the wonder come to pass. What is it saying? Is this something that he's just going to the word of God and preaching it to you? Hey, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. No, it's not just him reading the word of God or preaching the word of God. He's claiming that he's giving a new oracle from God or a new word from God. And it says, and if it come to pass. So what is it? He's predicting something, isn't he? He's saying this is going to happen. He's saying this. Do you want to find out whether or not someone's a prophet or a false prophet? And then he tells you, this is what a prophet does. A prophet is going to preach to you. And then he says, and if it come to pass. Right? Keep reading. We'll get the full context. Obviously, afterwards, he says, let's go after other gods. Verse 3, Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you, you to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. <clears throat> so he goes on to say that even if it does come to pass, and he's correct about this prophecy, that... If he tells you to go after other gods, you know right off the bat that this is a false prophet and that this, this sign or this wonder did not come from God. This is not a message that's coming from the Lord because the, even though that's true, it says because the Lord's trying you, right? Uh, keep reading. If you skip down, you'll see that he's put to death. Look at verse 5. And that prophet, that dreamer of dreams, shall be put to death because he has spoken to you to turn you away from the Lord your God which brought you out of the land of Egypt. I want you to... Um, and I'm going to read to you now from Matthew chapter number 1, verse number 22. I want you to keep in mind how notice that a prophet is someone that says something and then it comes to pass. Well, think about this. Look, think about it in the New Testament. Matthew chapter number 1, verse number 22. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet. Do you notice all that in there? Number one, what is it? Spoken of the Lord by the prophet. Do you know what a prophet does? 
the Lord speaks through him. Do you know what else? He preaches something that's going to come to pass. Notice that it's fulfilled. It's a new revelation. It's a new mystery or it's a new secret or something from God. It is something supernatural. It is a divine message that comes directly from God to man. And the Holy Spirit of the Lord comes upon him and he speaks the word of God. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So this is a true pop prophet. It was fulfilled and the Lord was speaking through him. Matthew chapter 2 verse 17. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet saying... <clears throat> Matthew 4.14, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, what are prophets? They are those that prophesy uh, uh, the word of the Lord, where the Spirit of the Lord comes upon them. They give a new message of something that is to come to pass. That is what it is 99% of the time. Now, there are other mysteries and secrets and things that are revealed to them, but most of the time, it's of future. A lot of the time, it has to do with something to come. I want you to go with me to, we're going to look at a couple of these just randomly in the major prophets. Go to Ezekiel chapter 13. Ezekiel chapter 13. The book of Ezekiel, chapter number 13. I want you to watch this here. We're going to read down here nine verses real quick. Ezekiel 13, look at verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, <clears throat> I'm sorry, yeah, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel that prophesy and say, Thou unto them that prophesy, watch this, out of their own hearts. Hear ye the word of the Lord. So are they bringing a new message or are they just going to Scripture and preaching something out of the Old Testament? No, they're prophesying out of their own hearts. So they're coming, they're false prophets, and they're not sent by God, and they're coming with a new message, and they're saying, you know, oftentimes they're saying, hey, there's going to be peace in Israel, aren't they? Hey, you know, we're not going to be destroyed, everything's going to turn around, right? That's the message that they would bring. While Ezekiel's coming and saying, you know, that they must repent, or this is what's going to happen. You're going to be destroyed. God's going to come in. And these are the judgment that's God, that God is going to bring upon you. Then there's these other guys over here saying, and they're saying it out of their own heart. They're not sent from God. This is not a revelation from God. The Spirit of the Lord has not come upon them. And they're there saying, and they're preaching, and, and saying, there's going to be peace. Don't worry about it. It's not the Spirit of the Lord. They're speak, speaking it or preaching out of their own heart. Look at verse 3. Thus saith the Lord God, Woe unto the foolish prophets, watch this, that follow their own spirit, look closely, and have seen nothing. Notice that. Have seen nothing. Why? Because a prophet's a seer. And this guy didn't see anything, so what is he? He's a false prophet. He hasn't seen any dreams. He hasn't seen any visions. I haven't showed him anything. He's not sent by me. It's false. Look at what it says next. O Israel, thy prophets are like the foxes in the desert. Ye have not gone up into the gaps, neither made up the hedge for the house of Israel to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. They have, watch this, they have seen vanity, that means nothing, and lying divination, saying the Lord saith and the Lord hath not sent them. And they have made others to hope that they would confirm the word. Notice it says lying divination. So what are they saying? They're saying, hey, here's a message from the Lord. This is what God sent me to preach unto you. He says, I didn't send them. And they're preaching vanity. And he says, they saw nothing. Why? Because the prophet's a seer. God gives them a vision. God gives them a dream. And then they're supposed to go preach this in the spirit of the Lord. That's why he said that he didn't send them. And it says, they follow their own spirit. Why? Saying, because it's not my spirit. Because when a prophet preaches, the Spirit of the Lord comes upon him. Look at the next verse. Verse uh, 7. Have ye not seen, a, watch this, a vain vision? Who's he talking to? Prophets. Because prophets are seers. And have ye not spoken a lying divination? Whereas ye say, the Lord saith, albeit I have not spoken. Verse 8. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, because ye have spoken vanity and seen lies. Notice the seeing over and over and over again. Because a prophet is a seer. That is what a prophet is. Therefore, behold, I am against you, saith the Lord God, and mine hand shall be upon the prophets that see vanity and that divine lies. They shall not be in the assembly of my people, neither shall they be written in the, uh, in the writing of the house of the Lord, neither shall they enter in the land of, of, of Israel, and so forth and so forth. Flip over. We'll look at verse 16 in the same chapter. I want you to notice this. Verse 7, well, yeah, verse 16. To wit, the prophets of Israel which prophesy concerning Jerusalem, watch this, and which see visions of peace for her, and there is no peace, saith the Lord God. What do they say that they're, that they're doing? Saying they're seeing visions. Hey, this is what the Lord came to me and showed me. It's false. Why? If they want to 
they want to feign or fake to be a prophet, they have to say, hey, I saw something, because that's what prophets are. They, are, they receive visions, they receive dreams, and they're called seers. Look at verse 17. Likewise, thou son of man, set thy face against the daughter of thy people, which prophesy out of their own heart, and prophesy thou against them. Go to Jeremiah 14. Jeremiah 14. When you stop and think about it, <clears throat> whoops, I'm going the wrong way. When you stop and think about it, Every time when someone goes and it says prophesy against that city, prophesy against that city, what are they going to do? Every time. They're bringing a message of coming destruction almost every single time. And what is a way to know whether it's a true prophet? If it comes to pass. It's something in the future. And the Spirit of the Lord sent them and they see a vision and they see a dream. And God, that's how you know whether you're a prophet. And you know what they do? They prophesy. The Spirit of the Lord's going to come upon you, Saul. And you're going to prophesy. It's the result of the Spirit of God coming upon someone. In the miraculous way. Not just, it's like the day of Pentecost. We're going to look at that in a minute. That's what it's like. It's not just the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You know, it's actually the Spirit of the Lord coming upon them and speaking the pure, inspired Word of God through them where the Spirit of the Lord is moving them. Look at uh, Jeremiah 14, 13. 14, 13. <clears throat> then said I... Ah, Lord God, behold, the prophets say unto them, You shall not see the sword, neither shall ye, ye have famine, but I will give you assured peace in this place. Notice it's always of something to come, saying it's going to be peace, right? Look at verse 14. Then the Lord said unto me, The prophets prophesy lies in my name. I, send, I sent them not, neither have I commanded them, neither spake unto them. They prophesy unto you a false vision and divination, and a thing of naught, and a deceit of their own heart. Verse 15. Therefore thus saith the Lord concerning the prophets that prophesy in my name, and I sent them not. Yet they say, Sword and famine shall not be in this land. This land. By sword and famine shall those prophets be consumed. What is it? What are they claim to be? What is a prophet? He's someone that sees something. They, they come and they say, hey, this is our vision or dream that we saw. Let me preach it or prophesy it unto you. And it's something to come, right? It's something that's going to happen in the future. Jeremiah 23, 16. Look one more time at this. Jeremiah 23, 16. I believe I have the right verse here. <clears throat> Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Hearken not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you. They make you vain. Watch this. They speak a vision of their own heart and not out of the mouth of the Lord. Two things you learn there. Number one, they speak a vision of their own heart saying it's not a vision from God. God said that's the way you're going to know that you're a prophet. You're going to receive a vision or a dream from me. I'll make myself known in a vision or dream. And then it says this. And not out of the mouth of the Lord. Notice that. Not out of the mouth of the Lord. What does a prophet do? He speaks out of the mouth of the Lord. Out of the mouth of the Lord. Just like Exodus chapter number 7, verse number 1 and 2, it says this, And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a god to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. Thou shalt speak all that I command thee, and Aaron thy brother shall speak unto Pharaoh that he send the children of Israel out of his land. So notice that in this case, Moses is telling Aaron exactly what to say. He has a direct connection and he says, hey, here are the words that I want you to speak. It's a new message. He's not just going to scripture. That's not what's happening. That's never what prophesying is ever, where you go to old scripture and then you just preach that word for word. That's not what it, 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 that prophesying is. It's always a direct, supernatural connection to God where God reveals secrets, mysteries, visions, and dreams through you. Why? You have to keep going back in your mind. A prophet's a seer. A prophet is a seer. They are equivalent. When you're saying you're a prophet, you are saying you are a seer. Go to Deuteronomy 18.20. I want you to see this one more time. Deuteronomy 18.20. Deuteronomy chapter number 18, verse number 20. Deuteronomy chapter number 18, verse number 20, it says this, But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. And if thou say in thine heart, how shall we know? Watch this. How shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? So it's saying when a prophet comes, how do we know who's sent by God and who's not? So we're talking about a prophet. Look at verse 22. When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, watch this, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, 
That is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. So he's talking about a prophet. And how are we going to know who's a prophet and who's not a prophet? What is a prophet going to be doing? He's going to be coming and telling you something that is going to come to pass. That is what a prophet does. They come and they tell you, hey, this is what's going to come to pass. And so God just says, hey, if a man comes and he says he's a prophet, because God, of course, knows what a prophet preaches. He preaches something that's going to come to pass. God just says, hey, if a man comes, he says he's a prophet, and what he says is supposed to come to pass, doesn't? Well, he's, I didn't send him, because you know everything that I say is going to come to pass. So what's a prophet? He comes and preaches something that is going to come to pass. That is the definition of a prophet. He's revealing new mysteries, new revelations, new, a new message from God, and it usually pertains to something in the future. Uh, and then it says this, verse 22, when a prophet, let's, let's finish reading there, when a prophet speaketh the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. But the prophet has spoken presumptuously, pres uh, presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. Saying he spoke out of his own heart. Saying, I didn't give him those words. That's what he's saying. When someone comes and say, hey, I'm preaching to you in the name of the Lord. This message is being brought to you in the name of the Lord. You know what they're saying? Like, these are the words of God. He told me to come here and preach this to you. That is a prophet. If you uh, stop and think about it, you know, uh, think about the false prophet in the book of uh, Zechariah. Uh, Zechariah chapter 13, where he's speaking about end times. There's going to be a day that comes to pass where uh, all of the false prophets, <clears throat> they're, they're going to be scared to prophesy, it says. And when a, when, when a man prophesies, if it's a son, it says the father and the mother are going to thrust them through, right? What's he doing? Is he just preaching falsely the word of God? No, it says that every man, the very next verse, I believe it's verse uh, 13 or 14, something like that. It says, every prophet in that day shall be ashamed of his vision. Why? Because you know, they, they say they have these visions or dreams because that's what a prophet is. But at that time, they're going to be scared to, to preach their false visions because they're going to be put to death. Fathers and mothers would be even killing their own sons and saying, so what's a prophet? Over and over and over, you see example of false prophets, prophets, what happens? The Spirit of the Lord comes upon a man, and the Spirit of the Lord moves that man, and he speaks through that man, and it's a new revelation. It's a new mystery. It's a divine message. It is a supernatural message that comes from God, and it comes in the form of a vision and a dream. A prophet is called a what? A seer. That is what a prophet is. Why? Because they see visions and they see dreams and they are sent, listen this is very important, they are sent directly by God. And God makes himself known to them. There are not tons and tons and millions of prophets all over the world. That's not how it works. I don't believe there's any prophets today and I'm going to get into that in a minute. That's not how this works. These are people that God directly comes to and speaks to and gives visions and dreams to them. Uh, I want you to turn now. Let's look at. Um, hey, let's go. Let's go ahead and go to the New Testament. You can wait for me in the New Testament. Let's see if this lines up in the New Testament. Go to Acts chapter number two, verse number seventeen. Another example is with Micaiah, though, in the Old Testament. I'll give you that real quick while you turn there. Micaiah in chapter number twenty-two, verse number seven. It talks about how uh, uh, they wanted to inquire. Jehoshaphat said that he wanted to inquire of the Lord. When they say they want to inquire of the Lord, like when they wanted to go to the prophet or seer, which was Samuel at that time, they said the same thing. They wanted to inquire of God. What do they want? Hey, just open up the Bible and give me good wisdom. Give me some good counsel. Give me some good advice, prophet. That's not what they wanted. They wanted to know a specific message that only God would be able to reveal to them. They wanted to know a divine message of what they should do. They had lost their asses and they were trying to find them. They needed someone with a supernatural connection that knew where these things were. Jehoshaphat, he's getting ready to go forth to war and he says, hey, find me a man. Find me a prophet that I may inquire of the Lord. He says, are there any other prophets that I may inquire of God by besides Micaiah? What does he want? He wants specific information that only God could reveal to him through his man. A man of God. That is a prophet. He wants to know what's going to happen when I go to war. He doesn't just want advice. He doesn't just want to know, hey, what's a good military strategy? And the proof of that is when Micaiah comes, he says, you're going to die. And all of, these, all of Israel is going to be a sheep not having a shepherd. That is a prophecy, and that is a true prophet. He reveals things to come. A false prophet says, hey, this is what's going to come to pass, and it doesn't. That's why it says, thus was fulfilled by the prophet, quote, 
The Spirit of God comes upon a man and he reveals something that only God could reveal. That's a prophet. It's not just preaching the Word of God. And when you study it out, it's stupid and it's ridiculous. Now, I, I, you know, I had actually had the right interpretation of this when I was in the old IFB. But I wouldn't have really known how to explain it to you. I just thought prophecy is of the future. You know, prophets, it's what you hear most of the time. Prophets are those that have, I would have, you know, I don't know how I would have explained it, but I understood they had a direct connection with God. They were like the men of God. They weren't just, hey, you know, uh, the guy preached behind the pulpit is a prophet. I thought of Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. That's what prophets were to me. So I understood this, but not, you know, deeply. Not at all. But when you study it out, there is no break in this consistency. None. It's super, excuse me, super, super clear. So you're in the New Testament. Let's look at Acts chapter number 2. I want you to notice the consistency, you know, uh, in Acts chapter number 2. There's, you know, people have these weird ideas, so you have to prove this. Like, hey, New Testament's not any different. We don't get, get to the New Testament and a prophet's not a seer all of a sudden. You know, he's, he's not just the God of the Old Testament, he's the God of the New Testament also. Everybody know where that's coming from, the Jews and the Gentiles. Look at Acts chapter number 2, verse number 17. Acts chapter number 2, verse number 17, it's the day of Pentecost. I want to look at when the word prophesy, prophecy, and prophets is spoken of. Watch this. Look at Acts chapter number 2, verse number 17. <clears throat> And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, watch this, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Now watch the result of that again. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your sons and, I'm sorry, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and, the, your, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Notice the vision, dreams, and what are they doing? They're prophesying as a result of what? The Spirit of the Lord coming upon them. Look at verse 18. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my Spirit, and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. This is not people just normally preaching like I'm preaching right now. This is a miraculous... He says, I will pour out my Spirit upon them. What they were preaching at that time were the pure oracles of God. The word of the Lord was speaking purely through them. Just like it says, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. It wasn't a part of canon, and it wasn't a part of specific written down scripture, but there's a lot of prophecies and things where God just gives a direct message to a man that's not a part of scripture. This is perfect and, and pure, and there's nothing missing here, and this is exactly what we need for our lives. But there were a lot of other pure prophecies that were purely the word of God. I mean, if you, if you, if you think about it, Jesus Christ is 100% God, right? What does the end of book, the book of John say? There were so many other things that he spoke and that he did that if we were to write all the books, they, wouldn't even, they would fill the whole world. That's a bunch of words that, of God that are not in this book. There were tons of other prophecies and things that people spoke. That's the word of the Lord that, got, that is not meant or supposed to be in this book. It is just as much the word of the Lord as this. It's, it's on the same, if you will, not in the same sense of Scripture, but it is equivalent in the sense of it's just as much the Word of God as this is. It's not like me just standing up in here and preaching. That's what I want you to understand. It is the Word of God purely being spoken just like, listen to this, just like it was coming from the mouth of the Lord. Amen. That's what this was in Acts 2. It was just as pure and perfect as if it was coming from the mouth of the Lord. Let's see this even further. Look at Matthew chapter number 26, verse number 67. This is real, true prophesying, my friend. This is what it means to prophesy. Go to Matthew chapter number 26, verse number 67. Matthew chapter number 26, verse number 67. Notice that, like I said, it's someone who has a direct connection with God. They say, hey, let's go inquire of God. So we need to go to the prophet. We need to find out specific information that's supernatural. There's no one else that could tell us, hey, your, your asses are over here, right? You know, it's not just like, hey, he's a wise man because he's a man of God. And he's going to be like, well, you know, asses oftentimes like to travel to this little brook over here. That's not what's going on. It's supernatural, right? That's why I want you to notice. Look at Matthew 26, verse 67. Watch this. Matthew 26, 67. Look at verse... Yes, we'll start in 67. Then did they spit in his face and buffeted him, and others smote him with the palms of their hands. This is when Christ is being bitten by, uh, beaten by the Roman soldiers. Then look what it says in verse 68. 
saying, Prophesy unto us, thou Christ. Watch this. Who is he that smote thee? What are they telling him to do? To me, I'm sure he can't see them. Whatever's going on here, he's not able to see them. So what's going on is they, they, they're, they're going around and they're hitting him in the face. And, and while he's not able to see them, and then they respond to him, Hey, prophesy unto us, thou Christ. Who is he that smote thee? They're mocking him. What are they wanting him to do? They, he, they, he, they know that he's saying that he's like God, or that he's the son of God, or that he's a prophet of God. So they're saying, hey, if you're a prophet of God, prophesy unto us. Give us a supernatural message. If you're really of God, then give us you know, a, a, a proof of that. Tell us who it was that smote you. Because if you, you, know, you had the word of God and you know the word of God and you have this message or this connection with God, you should just be able to tell. Is he say, are they saying, hey, preach to us. Just preach the word of God to us. And they say, who was it that smote thee? This is something only, this is supernatural. The Roman soldiers have a better understanding of what prophesy means than a lot of Christians today do. He said, prophesy thou unto us. What is he saying? We want you to reveal this mystery. This is a secret. This is something that you could only tell us if you were a man of God and had a connection with God. Tell us who it is that smote thee. Look at John chapter number 11. I want you to see this again. Look at John chapter number 11. It's always the Spirit of the Lord speaking the words of the Lord. Because what is it when it's a prophet? It's God speaking through them. Of course God could say, hey, you did it. That's what it is. And they didn't understand, obviously, that was God in the flesh. So he could have easily said, hey, you hit me. You know, my wife and I were talking about this the other day. I mean, it, it, how foolish these people were that were just, and obviously they, they were ignorant. Uh, they didn't understand these things. But imagine if he would have just like, if he had a blindfold on or something, and it's like this guy over here. Because Jesus was wise beyond measure. The way he responds, he never, like, he always makes himself, you know, he never puts himself into a position where he looks bad. If he would have just like looked at the guy or something like that. That's how oftentimes when you know the character of Jesus, he does things like that. Look at John chapter number 11. Look at verse number 47. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. And the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. And it says this, And one of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, You know nothing at all. Nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation perish not. Look at verse 51. And this spake he, look at this, not of himself. Who spoke it? The Lord. Look at what it says next. But being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation. You know what a prophet does? He speaks not of himself. He speaks the word of the Lord. The spirit of the Lord speaks through him. And it is, listen to me, it is supernatural. Every time. John chapter number 9, we see also a similar situation where it's talking about uh, <clears throat> how Jesus heals the blind man. Right? He heals the blind man and they're, 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 they're consulting amongst each other. They bring the, 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 the man who's healed now in. And they're like, you know, some people are saying, you know, if this man, you know, if this, you know, this man's a sinner, how can he perform these miracles, right? And they ask him, what do you think about him? And he says he's a prophet. He says he's a prophet. Why? Because he's able to heal his sight. A prophet has a supernatural connection with God. John the Baptist is called a, there are not many people in the New Testament called a prophet, like specific names and people. John the Baptist is called a prophet. Do you know what the Bible says in John chapter number 1? There was a man sent from God whose name was John. I'm not sent from God how John was sent from God. You're not, you know, preachers and pastors are not just men sent from God. They are men of God who have a supernatural power upon them, which is the Holy Spirit. That is a prophet. I want you to go now with me. Go to Luke chapter number 7, verse number 39. Luke chapter number 7, verse number 39. I want you to see this again. Every time it's, a, it's supernatural. It's not just preaching the word of God. <clears throat> Look at Luke chapter number 7, verse number 39. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, this is when the woman was washing uh, Jesus' feet with the hair of her head, 
Now when the Pharisee which had bidden, it, bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, watch this, this man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. What does is, what is, what is the man that bidden him, the Pharisee, understand? That a prophet has a supernatural connection with God. They have mysteries and knowledge and secrets that are revealed unto them. Not like a normal man, not like a normal preacher. This is a prophet. This is what it means to prophesy. Of course, Revelation chapter number 1, verse number 3. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. What is it? It's a prophecy of something to come in the future. Revelation 22, 7. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Revelation 22, uh, 22 10. And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. So what is, what is that book called that I just read from? Revelation. Revelation. Why? Because this is a revelation from God that was given to a prophet. Because he has a supernatural connection with God. It is who? The prophet John. The apostle John. Apostle referred to as prophet sometimes as well. Because prophet is just those that are, are, are seers. They, and what did John do? Think about how the whole book of Revelation was given to John. A vision. To call him a prophet, what is he? What are you saying that he is? There are no exceptions of this. He's a seer. You know what he did? He saw what was to come to pass. We have Revelation chapter number 1, verse number 1, the very beginning, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. What's a prophet? Someone that's telling you what's going to come to pass. What's a false prophet? Someone that says something's going to come to pass, and it doesn't come to pass. In the New Testament, you have Balaam, who is referred to also as a prophet, right? Now, if you study him out, we were talking about this the other day. If you look at him real closely, I believe he's, he's for sure a false prophet. Uh, he's called a soothsayer in Joshua chapter number 1. There's a lot of other examples of this uh, where he's teaching, he's, he's teaching them to commit idolatry and fornication and things along those lines, and to go after uh, Ashtoreth, I believe it is. Um, but he, even if he is a false prophet, you know what happens in, when he, because he goes there, it says that, it says in uh, uh, the book of Numbers, it says that uh, Balaam went there to curse the nation of Israel, and then it says, nevertheless, the Lord turned the curse into a blessing. Because what happened? If you remember, it says that he falls into a trance. And you know what he does? He prophesies of the nation of Israel. And the Spirit of the Lord comes upon him and he speaks the word of the Lord of things concerning the nation of Israel to come in the future. That's what he does. And you know what he's called in the New Testament? A prophet. Why? Because the Spirit of the Lord came upon him and he revealed mysteries and secrets from God. That's why. That's why he was called a prophet every time. There are no exceptions. It's not just a random preacher around the corner. Every time. Study it out. Look at it on your own. There t it's mentioned tons and tons of times. I went over virtually every single time. I mean, one of them comes up like 500 times. I looked at them over and over and over and over again. The vast majority is in like all the major prophets. And you know what they're doing? God's saying, prophesy against that city. You know what he's saying? Bring, tell them the judgments that are shortly coming to pass. Tell them what I'm going to do to this city. You know what happens? The Spirit of the Lord comes upon them, like Ezekiel, like Jeremiah, and they speak the word of the Lord. So, uh, and also, uh, Revelation chapter number 1, verse number 1, like it says, the things which must shortly come to pass, two verses later it refers to it as prophecy. Notice, things which are shortly come to pass, prophecy, they're used interchangeable. Seer, he sees the vision, he sees the dream. Now, one of the verses, and in, 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 I want you to go to Proverbs 31, verse 1. One of the verses, and, we're, and then we're going to go to 1 Corinthians 14 and deal with that. Uh, Proverbs chapter number 31, verse number 1. This is one of the verses that people will use. And this is one of the verses that Stephen Anderson used to, to show that prophecy, and he supposedly is, is proving that prophecy is not something to come in the future every single time, which... Technically, it's not every single time. It is almost every time when you study it out. What it is is the Spirit of the Lord comes upon someone. It is a new revelation through that person, through the Spirit of God. And it's someone speaking you know, by the mouth of the Lord. That's what's going on. That is what a prophet is or what prophecy is. And Proverbs 31 verse number 1 does not negate everything that we saw. It actually bolsters what I've said throughout this sermon and what we've seen in all the other scriptures. Look at verse number one. The words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother 
taught him. Now, what is a prophecy? Prophecy is a new revelation or something from God. Why is this in your Bible? Proverbs chapter 31, verse number 1. Because it is the what? The Word of God. So what was given to her, and, if, and, and what did she speak by when she taught this? The Holy Spirit of God. Any more questions? I mean, isn't that clear? This is God's Word. You say, oh, because it said taught. When Jonah went to Nineveh and he said, 40 days and you're going to be overthrown, he was teaching them something. I mean, come on. You've got to be kidding me. That's just of something that's specifically to come to pass. This is a secret revelation from God on its specific knowledge about the virtuous woman, about drinking, things that are truths from God that come directly from the mind of the Lord. And God spoke through them. This, these are, it's, it's, it's specific knowledge from God. That's what it is. And it is the word of the Lord. It's just as much a prophecy. Just like we see in 1 in first Peter what it talks about. How they're moved by the Holy Ghost. That's what this is. That's what prophecy is. And she was moved by the Holy Ghost. Just like sons and daughters were prophesying in Acts 2. This is perfectly consistent because it's the Word of God. That, I don't know how people could be confused by that. Go to 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians chapter number 14. Now, do you think that the entire Bible has one definition of prophesy and then 1 Corinthians 14 has a totally different definition of prophesy? No. What's the definition clearly that we've seen? It's all consistent, isn't it? It's, is it just someone just preaching the Word of God? It's not. It's not at all. That is not what the word prophesy means. That's not what a prophet is ever. So we need to understand the definition of a word before we get to a passage. That's what we need to do. We need to start with the definition of what the word is and we clearly understand it. And to be honest, this passage is not difficult to understand either when you have the right definition of the word prophesy and prophet. Now let me say this, sometimes you can be the problem. When you have a, the wrong idea you know, lodged into your mind about what a word means and you've read a passage numerous, numerous times over and over and over again with a certain idea in your mind, sometimes it can be difficult. And you could probably look back at this where you've read a verse the wrong way every time. And even when you get the right interpretation, you keep, your mind keeps like going back to that old wrong interpretation. It's hard to understand the right interpretation. Now maybe that can happen for you. But I want you to look at everything that we just saw. It is so clear of what prophesy means when people are, are prophesying. Prophesy unto us, thou Christ, who smote thee. I mean, over and over and over again. It's the Spirit of the Lord coming upon them. That's what I want you to understand when we go here into 1 Corinthians 14. And we're going to walk through the, the latter portion of 1 Corinthians 14 that deals with prophesying and that deals with prophets. No, normally when people go to 1 Corinthians 14, they're looking at 1 Corinthians 14 on the subject of tongues. That's normally. But we're going to be focused on the latter portion of this. And it has to do with prophesying or being a prophet. So let's start here in 1 Corinthians 14. Verse number 22. Wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. Verse 23. If therefore the whole church be come together into one place, and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that ye are mad? Look at verse 24. But if all prophesy, and there come in one that believeth not, or one unlearned, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all. Verse 25, And thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. I want to, I want to compare some other scriptures to this to, to make it extremely clear. Now, first of all, I forgot to read these just a moment ago. Uh, but I want to kind of present to you, I apologize, this is a little bit out of order. I should have read this first before we started in 1 Corinthians 14. Um, uh, I, want, I want to present to you what people will say today. And, and this group that is really screwed up on this, these few people that are very messed up on this. They will say that, you know, God has set in the church apostles, prophets, right? And this big list. And I'm going to read those passage to, passages to you. And what they will say is, you know, 
uh, that in the church today we can see apostles, we can see prophets, because that would have to be their interpretation. Now, are there apostles in the church today? There are not. There are not apostles in the church today. Now, according to what we've seen of what a prophet is, are there those type of people in the church today either? They're not. So, we all agree, and even that group would agree, apostles are not here anymore, are they? No. So, would it be far-fetched to say, after we've even seen the definition of a prophet, to say that there aren't prophets today either? That wouldn't be far-fetched at all, would it? Ephesians 4.11, here's the verse that they use. And, and, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Are there apostles today? They're not. I present to you that there aren't prophets either. I'm going to prove this to you. 1 Corinthians 12, 28. And, and God has set some in the church. First apostles. I want you to notice the order of this too. First apostles. Secondarily prophets. Third, thirdly teachers. After that miracles. Then gifts of healings. Helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Now, 1 Corinthians 12, 28. Two chapters before this. Are there apostles in the church today? No. Are there... Well, we'll skip prophets because that's what we're contending about. I would agree there are teachers... Are there people that work miracles like they did at the time of Paul and things like that and Peter? They're not, are they? Then gifts of healings. Now, we, we could pray and things like that, but are there gifts of healings like Paul and Peter and how his shadow and, and you know, either raising people from the dead and Eutychus falls out of the window and Paul goes down there. Is that types of healings going on today? No. Helps, governments, and it says this, diversities of tongues. Do people speak in other tongues like they did at that time either? They didn't, did they? So a lot of these things have seen... This is called cessationism. This is uh, a, a, a type of theology. You know, today there are certain miracles and signs and wonders that are no longer active in the church. They are not active. Jesus in Mark 16, 16, or Mark 16, uh, 20, I think is the last verse in the, in the chapter of Mark 16. He says very plainly, when he sends forth his disciples... He says he wants them to go forth and preach the word. He wants them to go forth into all the world, right? He wants them to go forth and preach. And he talks about how they're going to be able to work miracles. And then he says, in the, is it verse 20? Did you just flip there? It says that they are to confirm the word with the signs, right? And what are the signs? The miracles that he just mentioned they're going to be able to do. Why? While they go throughout the whole world. When Paul died, Paul was not able to heal people anymore. He talks about uh, who was sick? Luke, right? Luke was with him and was sick. Is that correct? That's not right. Paul was sick. Paul was sick. Duh. Yeah, yeah. Well, there was someone else that was with him, I believe, that was sick. But either way, there, you know, uh, uh, he wasn't able... What would you say? Tychicus. Tychicus. There were people that were traveling with him that he was not able to heal anymore. Why? Do you know what Paul says in Colossians chapter 1? The gospel had already went to the whole world. That's why. So it makes perfect sense that those would cease at that time. That he was no longer able to work miracles. They were no longer doing signs and wonders because it was for the job of preaching the, the, the Word of God to everyone. That makes perfect sense. We don't see people speaking with other tongues today. These are signs and wonders that were to be given while they were confirming the Word, while they were preaching the Gospel to the entire world. So, the Bible says, first apostles, secondarily prophets. Well, we saw a lot of mentions of prophets in the New Testament, and they were always divine messages coming straight from the mouth of the Lord, right? But this is what's interesting. We're actually told of a specific man that is called a prophet in the local New Testament church, in the New Testament scriptures. His name is Agabus. I want you to turn with me to Acts chapter number 11, verse number 26. We're going to see what this man was able to do. Acts chapter number 11. See if it lines up with. This is a man that's mentioned here. He would be among that list of 1 Corinthians 12, 28. How secondarily prophets were in there, right? Well, let's see what a prophet can do. Let's see what a prophet is. Whether he's just a preacher of the Word of God. He just stands up and just preaches. Or whether it lines up with the rest of the Bible of what we saw. Look at 1 Corinthians 11, verse 26. It says this. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled, that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were, first, were called Christians first in Antioch. Watch this. And in the, these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch. So we're going to be able to learn something here. They're coming unto the church, right? Look at the next verse, 28. And there stood up one of them named Agabus. Now watch this. And signified by the Spirit. Notice that. That there should be great dearth throughout all the world. Which came to pass. 
in the days of Claudius Caesar. You want a definition of a prophet in the New Testament? Agabus. That's who a prophet is that was in the church. Secondarily prophets. You know who that is? Agabus. Do you know what he did? He stood up and he signified by the Spirit. By the Spirit of God. And what happened? It says it came to pass. It was fulfilled. Right. Thus, was, thus was fulfilled by the prophet Isaiah, Jeremiah. Look at another example. Acts 21. Acts chapter number 21, verse number 10. You want to see who the prophets are that, are, that were in the local New Testament church? Look at Acts chapter number 21, verse number 10. And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet. See what he can do. Let's see what prophets can do. Named Agabus. And when he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle and bound his own hands and feet. Watch this. said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost. Isn't this clear? It says this, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle, and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And when we heard these things, both we and they of that place besought him not to go up to Jerusalem. What did he say? Hey, here's something that's going to come to pass. How did he do it? He spoke by the mouth of the Holy Ghost. He said, Who are the prophets in the New Testament? Agabus. That's a prophet. You want to know what the prophets like in the New Testament are? They're just like the prophets of the Old Testament. They do exactly the same thing. They speak by the Spirit of God. The Holy Ghost comes upon them and moves them and gives them a secret and a revelation and a mystery that is supernatural that no other man could just stand up and preach. See what a fool you sound like saying, Hey, I'm a prophet. Prophesy unto me like Agabus prophesied, you fool. You say, hey, this is a little bit too strong for a situation like this. People are starting what they consider legitimate New Testament churches and standing up and saying, I'm a prophet. Right. Agabus was a prophet. You are not a prophet. You are not a prophet unless the Spirit of God stands up and, and speaks through you. Tell me about a dearth to come, oh prophet. Tell me about a famine that's going to come. You know, tell me about how I'm going to be arrested. Right? You know, you, you could be like uh, uh, Nostradamus now. It wouldn't be that e difficult right now if you knew what's going on in my life. Right? It might be a little bit easier. You know? Agabus is a prophet. That's a real prophet in the New Testament. Let me give you an example. John was a prophet. You know what a prophet is? It's a seer. That's a prophet. You know what he, he saw? He signified by the Holy Ghost and the Spirit of God spoke through him. Agabus is a prophet. Hey, you want to preach the Word of God? You want to stand up and you want to pastor the church one day? Shut your stinking mouth. Go and sit under a man with authority that God said, set a man over the congregation. Go learn under someone and stop being a prideful jerk. Amen. See how foolish you are. It's retarded. You say, they, you, know, you say, oh, this isn't what's going to change people. This is exactly what's going to change someone. This is People like this, hey, don't think I hate them, because this is what people do. You know, the Bible says, Thou shalt not hate thy neighbor in thy heart, thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor. I love him. That's why I'm doing this. All of them. They, listen to me. I'm sorry that this has to go out to everyone, but this has gone on way too long. They are a bunch of novices. They don't know the Bible. That's why someone can stand up and say, I, I, I prayed about this for so long, I've, you know, I've, I've done this, I've done that, and this is what I've come up with. Look how wrong it is according to the Bible. It's so wrong. It's not even close. Not even close to what the Bible teaches. Agabus is a prophet. That's a real prophet. He speaks by the Holy Ghost. New Testament. Is this even, is it crystal clear like I said it would be? Yeah. Listen to me. There are no exceptions. Be a Berean and search them out for yourself. And come back to me. You know, this is what it is. It's the Spirit of the Lord coming upon someone. And they speak the Word of God. Not like just, hey, I'm preaching to you. The will of the Lord be done. And after those, after those days we took up our carriages and went up to Jerusalem. And then I expound upon that scripture. They give a new revelation like, hey, Paul, you're going to be arrested and this is going to happen when you go to Jerusalem. Hey, there's, think about that. There's going to be a dearth next year. Can you imagine if I stood up here and I said, there's going to be a famine across all of the United States. We're going to have a famine. We need to move. 
to Canada. I'm a prophet of God. That's a real prophet. Do you understand this? This is a real prophet. Just like, and you know, I'm going to give you a couple other scriptures. Let, I don't want to go on my rant for too long here. I've got to rein it in. Go back to 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 14. So when we read this here, I want you to notice that it says, <clears throat> verse 24, But if all prophesy in there, come in one that believeth not, or one unlearned, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all. Now I want you to look at verse 25. And thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest. Notice secrets. Thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest, and so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. What did they tell Jesus? Prophesy unto us. What, are they, what is he doing? He's revealing secrets. You know, uh, what, did, what did the man say, the Pharisee, that Jesus came into his house? How did he, he said, if, if he were a prophet, he'd know what manner of woman, he'd know what woman and manner of woman she is that touched him. And then you know what Jesus does? He responds to the thoughts in his heart. The secrets of his heart were made manifest. Um, John chapter number 4, verse number 18. Keep your hand here. Turn to John chapter number 4, verse number 18 with that in mind. Just, just, it, it, this is just over and over and over and over again. Look at John chapter number 4, verse number 18. Notice the secrets of his heart are made manifest. John chapter number 4, verse number 18. <clears throat> Jesus speaking to the woman at the well, For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that sayest thou truly. Watch this. The woman say unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Why? Because the secrets of her heart were what? Made manifest. It's supernatural. That is a prophet. That is prophesying. This is what it is, people. It's so stinking clear. This is the secret. Why are they falling down? Because it's not just, hey, that's a great sermon. Oh my gosh. The secrets of my heart are made manifest. That's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. What did she say? Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. You're a prophet of God. You know why? Because she knew, she didn't specifically know yet that he was the Lord, but she knew that he was speaking at least by the Spirit of the Lord, that he was at least sent from God and had a supernatural connection of God that was going on here. Look at, uh, I'm going to read you from Revelation 10, Revelation chapter 10, verse 7. Think about this and listen to what I'm saying right now. The secrets of the heart made manifest. Uh, a direct connection from God. They're able to reveal supernatural things. Listen to Revelation 10, 7. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. What did he declare to his prophets? Mysteries. Mystery, secrets of the heart. Daniel 2.30, But as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living, but for their sakes, and so on and so on. Oh, no, 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 I'm going to read that. For their sakes shall make known the interpretation of the king, and that thou mayest know the thoughts of thy heart. That, I, that was crucial. Not, I almost didn't read that. No, notice that. That you may know the thoughts of your heart. The secrets of his heart are made manifest. Guess what Daniel's called in 24.15, Matthew 24.15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. It's clear as stinking day. Go back to 1 Corinthians 14, look at verse number 26. How is it then, brethren, when ye come together? Every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. So he's talking about a problem that they're having in the church where everything's out of order. He gets specifically on prophesying as well here in a minute, but in general they just have a problem with things being out of order because one guy wants to do this, one guy wants to do that. They all want to do all these different things. They're not doing things in order. Look at verse 27. <clears throat> if any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most by three and that by course and let one interpret. Do people speak in unknown tongues today? Did people get up and speak in an unknown tongue like they did in Acts 2? No, they don't. Now, if a man came in here that was like a missionary from some other country, he could speak in an unknown tongue without it being like something miraculous. But we would only do that if we had an interpreter, right? If we want to try to apply this scripture today. But do people speak with other tongues like they did in Acts 2? No. So is it far-fetched to say, hey, prophesying doesn't apply today? Especially not what we've read of what prophesying is. No, not at all. 
Look at what it says next. I want you to keep that in mind. But if there be an interpreter, verse 28, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. Now watch verse 29. Let the prophet speak two or three and let the other judge. Now, I want to point out just a misunderstanding that they have in general that's not even related to this specifically. They don't even understand what prophet means or prophesy means. But I'm going to point out what they, they, they don't even, they're misunderstanding just this text alone, okay? Because they say there that everyone are prophets and everyone can prophesy. I want you to go back. You read 1 Corinthians 12 before you read 1 Corinthians 14. So I want you to go back to 1 Corinthians 12 first. Go back to 1 Corinthians 12, chapter 12, verse 29 with me. <clears throat> are all apostles, are they? Are all prophets? No. Okay. Are all teachers? No. Are all workers of miracles? No. Are all gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? Notice most of the things on that list don't even apply today, do they? Are all prophets? No. No. So, when we read, does it, should we assume that when he says, let the prophets, that he's speaking to every person? No. He's speaking to who? The prophet. I mean, goodness, stinking sakes. First uh, Corinthians uh, uh, 12, verse 8 as well. Look at 1 Corinthians 12, 8. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. Now watch this. To another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. Now I want you to notice, the, now some people can have both, right? Some can. But what's the, uh, 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 the concept that's being taught right there? That one person has one thing and another person has something else. Just in general, right? Okay, keep reading. Verse 9. To another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one in the self same Spirit. Watch this. Dividing every man severally as he will. Are you kidding me? So, it's very clear. It's, it, the comprehension of this is very simple. Not everyone has gifts of healing. Not every, everyone is interpreting the, the tongues. Not everyone speaks with tongues. Not everyone's working miracles. Not everyone is an apostle. Right? What else is something on the list? Not everyone is discerning of spirits. I mean, not everyone um, has the word of knowledge. Not everyone prophesies. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Go back to 1 Corinthians 14. But even just that aside, the statement alone proves this. Because he doesn't address the whole church. That's why he says, let the, let the prophet speak two or three and let the other judge. Is he speaking to everyone? Who's he speaking to? The prophets. Let the prophet speak. That alone tells you that everyone's not a prophet. He's specifically talking to the prophets. Okay? You have, firstly, you have, and, and, and even when you read about the, the people at Corinth, are they all just like these spiritual giants? Not at all. You'd have to say, and, and we already know what a prophet is and all of that. I'm not going to, you know, I don't want to back up and go back through that again. You'd have to say that everyone there is like, because it says firstly apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers. You'd have to say that the church is filled with just all prophets. They're all Agabuses there. And they're all just like prophesying of dearths to come and famines to come and all of that. Do you see what a mess this is and how, t just when you try to apply it, how ridiculous it is? No, it's those that are prophets. This is just what needs to happen to those that, with, that are prophets. Let the prophet speak two or three and let the other judge. Watch this. Verse 30. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. Ephesians 3.3. 3. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, notice all of this, as I wrote a four and few, few words, whereby when you read ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, but as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. You notice that? Do you know where it comes from? Holy apostles and prophets. Holy apostles and prophets, those are true revelations, my friend. Things that are like Scripture. You're not standing up and preaching things that are on par with Scripture. That's what you're saying when you say, I'm standing up here and prophesying. Those are mysteries. Not only that. Uh, I skipped it somewhere. Where is it at? This is also right in line with that. Amos 3.7. Listen to this. 
Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but He revealeth His secret unto His servants, the prophets. Kind of like the secrets of His heart are made manifest. Notice, revealing. Hey, hey, sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Prophesy unto us, O Christ, who it is that smote thee. If this man were a prophet, he'd know what woman and manner of woman she is that toucheth him. There's no, there's no exceptions. Things are revealed. He speaks by the Holy Spirit. There's going to be a great dearth in the land. There's going to be a great famine in the land. Ezekiel sent, hey, this, this city is going to be destroyed. This and this and this is what's going to happen. Prophecy in the book of Revelation. Of things to come in the New Testament. This is prophecy. This is true prophecy. By the mouth of the Lord. Caiaphas, when he prophesies, what's he do? This spake he not of himself. This spake he not of himself. What does Saul do? What's a false prophet in the Old Testament? It's someone that says, hey, this is going to come to pass. And it doesn't. Hey, I'll make myself known unto the prophet. I'll, I'll appear unto him in a vision and a dream. You want to know what a prophet is? He's a seer. Oh, seer. You want to stand up and call yourself a seer? Think about how foolish this is. It's ridiculous. <clears throat> Look there in uh, 1 Corinthians 14 still. 1 Corinthians 14, what was the last verse we read? <clears throat> and it says in verse uh, 31, For ye may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn and all may be comforted. So everybody just stands up and prophesies? Reading comprehension is key. Who is he speaking to? Prophets. Back up to verse 29. Let the prophets speak. That ye may all prophesy. Who? Who prophesies? Prophets. This is really basic. It really is. It's super important. It's context. He's not speaking to everyone. He's speaking to the prophets. So this is just a side misunderstanding that they have. Just a lack of, 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 of comprehension of reading, really, is really what it is. And then we have, not only that, we have right before this saying, are all, are all apostles, are all prophets? No! He's not talking to everyone in the church. No! Okay? Look at what it says next. For God, uh, and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. Verse 35. And if they will learn anything, this is kind of not relevant for a minute, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for, a woman, for women to speak in the church. Verse 36. What? Came the word of God out from you, or came it unto you only? If, watch this, though. This is very important. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, watch this, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. What's he saying? This is not my words. This spake he not of himself. That's what he's saying. This is the commandments of God. You know, what, what is he saying? I'm a prophet. I'm not just speaking my own words. These are the commandments of God. Just like you have in, in what we read in Ephesians 4. That's good to look at one more time and read it one more time real quick. Or Ephesians 3, I'm sorry. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote afore in words. Whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men. What is it? The Spirit of the Lord speaks through Paul. It's not just preaching. That's not what prophesying is ever in the Bible. You can search it out. You can study it out. It's ridiculous. Look it up. You know, study it for yourself. You don't need me. Be a Berean, really. I truly want you to study the word prophet, prophesy every time. I mean, this is clear. This is what it is. And you'll see that. A prophet is someone that speaks not of himself, but by the Spirit of the Lord. It's someone that has a supernatural connection with God. That God reveals revelations, mysteries, and secrets to him. That's why the woman said, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. You know why? Because the secrets of her heart were made manifest. And as a result of that, like it talks about in 1 Corinthians 14 there, they'll fall down and worship God. It's not just because you stood up and preached an excellent sermon. You just gave an excellent, you know, uh, you know exposition of the Beatitudes. And they're just like, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet sent from God. It's ridiculous. It really is. It really is. It, you know, it says preach the word, not prophesy the word. 
When you understand the definition, it sounds foolish. It's not the same. Right? A pastor... So, here's the thing. Apostles aren't here anymore. Agabus is gone. There are, there, those things aren't happening anymore. We're not speaking with other tongues. Cessationism is a, is, a, is a true, real, clear doctrine in the Bible. They lost the ability to heal even while the apostles were still alive because the, they'd already preached the whole world. So he, he said that I'm giving you these signs and wonders to confirm the word while you're preaching to the whole world. So you know what happened when the whole world received it? Like he said in Colossians 1, signs and wonders are gone at some point. That's why Paul's not able to work miracles anymore. You know? The last, this is, what, this, is, this is basic theology. This is not just, you know, uh, you know Pastor Tyler Baker's opinions about these things. This is, this is what you know, everyone that believes, you know, in any sort of theology that's in that's cessationism. You know, we're, I realize people call us Pentecostals, but we're not really Pentecostals, guys. Everyone that understands cessationism, they all believe the same thing. That these things have ceased. They're not happening anymore. You know what the last prophecy was? The book of Revelation. Canons closed. That's why he says, that's why it ends. Surely he cometh, comes quickly. You know what we're waiting on? There's no more prophets. There's no more apostles. You know, you're not going to stand up to me and prophesy to me about a coming you know, earthquake. Okay? Keep it to yourself, John Hagee. Right? <laughs> that's not happening. There are no prophecies that are happening anymore. So, you know, that's a prophet. The, the, that, you know, and, and notice they even have the definition right, don't they? Of prophecy and prophesy. The, the mainstream view is correct. Do you know who jacked these people up? Do you know? The man that they hate the most. Stephen Anderson. And that is not the correct definition of prophet and prophesy. This is clear. I hope, let me end with this right here. I hope... And people take hard stances on things. People start ministries based on false doctrine sometimes. I'm not even saying specifically what they're doing. I'm saying people start a ministry that's like, like a pre-trib ministry where they're going around teaching like a pre-tribulation rapture. You know what I'm saying? Or like their whole ministry is based on maybe some, some, something that's false. You know, whatever it may be. You know, dispensationalism. They start a whole ministry and they base it on this. But you know what you need to do? I don't care how, di how, how deep you've dug into this false doctrine. You know what you need to do? You need to show God you love Him. And you love His Word. And you need to take that stinking doctrine and throw it in the trash and kick it out the door. And show God, hey, I really care what the truth is. Even if I make myself look like a fool. Amen. People will respect you. Amen. I would. Yeah. I would, seriously. Amen. If you said, hey, that's what the Bible teaches. I was wrong. I would think, man, you are more of a man than I thought you were. Yeah. Anybody. I'm serious. When you get caught up in false, false doctrine, don't be too proud to realize, I don't care if I preach something that's false for 40 years. Gosh, I, I hope so badly that, that I'll be the man that when someone comes to me, they say, hey, this is wrong. And I see it in the Bible and I know that I'm wrong. I hope when I'm 70, 80, I don't care if I've preached a sermon on it every year since this church has started. I hope that I'm the man to say, I was wrong. Stand up before my congregation, apologize for when I preach something wrong, and now I'm going to preach unto you the truth. Amen. That's who we need to be as Christians. We need to be humble. Amen. We need to care about the truth. Amen. Doesn't matter what if you if you look full, who cares? Who cares? And I don't think you would. I, I'm serious. I'm dead serious about that. I would respect people if they did that. They're like, I was totally wrong about that. You know, we shouldn't hate these people. You should, you know, still love our brethren even when they're very wrong about things. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for the clarity of your word. Just from New Testament.